In pop culture, a red shirt is a minor character who can be easily killed off, leaving the stars of the show to star another day. The name actually references the red shirts worn by such characters in the original Star Trek series, and not the colour of a minor character's shirt after they've bled all over it. But the red shirt isn't just cannon fodder in TV and movies. Science fiction games are similarly packed with such characters so hopelessly full of optimism and bravery and bloody entrails that we give them ten minutes tops before those entrails are decorating the level like beads at a Mardi Gras parade. Here are seven of the most hapless video game red shirts who were doomed to die in space. Beware of spoilers for the following games, but they are spoilers about the deaths of characters I guarantee you don't care about, so maybe don't worry too much. This mission. That's crazy. The captain's in charge here. He wouldn't. What do you think, Commander? We won't be staying on Eden Prime too long, will we? I'm itching for some real action. The soaring space opera of the Mass Effect series gave us some of gaming's most memorable characters. Garrus, Morden Solus, Jenkins... Wait, who the f*** is Jenkins? Oh, right, Corporate Richard L. Jenkins is an Alliance Marine who is on Commander Shepard's squad right at the start of Mass Effect 1. You, like us, might have forgotten who he is because he dies quicker than a Dark Souls player whose controller has run out of batteries. For the eagle-eyed players, there are clues that Jenkins may not be destined for a long, healthy life. For a start, he's constantly talking about how excited he is to go on a mission to prove himself in combat. This is my big chance. I need to show the brass what I can do. Then there's the fact that Jenkins' face looks like it was designed in about 40 seconds in the character creator, for a completely unrelated game about the risks of not getting enough fresh air and exercise. This mission isn't about personal glory, Corporal. We have a job to do. Don't do anything stupid to mess it up. Don't worry, sir. I'm not gonna screw this up. Mm. Inevitably, it turns out that Jenkins is not, in fact, the ass-kicking space hero he longs to be. At the first sign of danger, namely a couple of Geth drones, Jenkins immediately forgets all his training, sprints out of cover into the open, and gets hit with more lasers than the crowd at a Coachella DJ set. <laughs> Jenkins, no! We didn't even get a chance to do his loyalty mission! Or romance him! Okay, fine, but I mean, the, the loyalty mission? Can we lose the... Uh, thank you. Rip right through his shields. You're out of chance. Ensign Everts, who has never been this close to snow before in his life, gazes with childlike fascination at the ground. In early 90s Star Trek games, Star Trek 25th Anniversary, you embark on missions in which you control an away team composed of Captain Kirk, Commander Spock, Dr. McCoy and Ensign Everts. Guess which one is least likely to survive to be beamed back aboard the Enterprise? I'll give you a clue. Three of them are on the box. Ensign Everts, you'll notice, wears a red shirt, and as mentioned previously, the term red shirts originates from Star Trek, in which red uniforms are worn by the Enterprise security team, aka the guys most likely to get shot at by bad aliens. The red shirt rule holds true in Star Trek 25th Anniversary, in which it is spectacularly easy to get the red shirt on your team killed. This is on account of how they're always the first to be shot at with lasers, but also their magnetic attraction to flying rocks, but also, oh hey, sentient vines, that's a new one. Some of the red shirt deaths you have to work quite hard for, like this one, in which you force him to stick his hands into some faulty electrical wiring over and over again. But it's all worth it to help a red shirt fulfil his life's purpose, dying stupidly. Man, I bet the other officers are devastated. Probably, in honour of brave Ensign Everts, one of them will now say something moving. He's dead, Jim. Or something accurate. Just accurate, I guess. You are strong, child, but I will break you. I'll never fall to the dark side. From Obi-Wan Kenobi to Jyn Erso to Jack Porkins, Star Wars is all about heroic acts of self-sacrifice. R.I.P. them. Cut from the same heroic cloth as those Star Wars legends is one Trask Ulgo from Star Wars Knights of the Old Republic. Trask Ulgo is your roomie aboard Republic cruiser the Endar Spire, who is probably looking forward to a long illustrious career as a Republic officer when you come under attack by the Sith. I'm Trask Ulgo. 
Ensign with the Republic Fleet. I'm your bunkmate here on the Endar Spire. We work opposite ships. I guess that's why you haven't seen me before. Your ship is a-rocking because the Sith have come a-knocking for very important Jedi, Bastila Lashan. As far as you're concerned, you and your buddy Trask are merely Republic grunts trying to flee the ship before the Sith blast it into a fine space dust. Bastila was not here on the bridge. They must have retreated to the escape pods. We better head that way too. Bad luck for you two that on your way to the escape pods you run into Dark Jedi and part-time stage magician Darth Bandon. Damn, another Dark Jedi! I'll try to hold him off. You get to the escape pods. Go! And that was the last we saw of Trask Olgo, who either dies off screen a few minutes later when the Endar Spire is obliterated, or more likely, a few milliseconds later when Darth Bandon chops off his head with a lightsaber. But Trask's act of heroic self-sacrifice in holding off Bandon lets you make it to the very last remaining escape pod. I'll never forget you. Trask Arglo, was it? It's thanks to Trask and that final escape pod that you're free and alive to escape the Endar Spire with roguish Kartha Nassi, who is wearing a shirt that is much less red. Come on, there'll be time for questions later. Your name will echo down the ages, Trash Argo. Is that right? Sounds right. Don't move. What was that? A berserker. She can hear us. She can smell us. The life expectancy for a soldier in Gears of War is roughly the same as that of a mayfly with a two-pack-a-day cigarette habit. But even by these low, low standards, Giles takes the cake and then chokes to death on it. Near the start of Gears of War, Marcus Phoenix and his gang of powerlifting cog bros are confronted by a locust berserker, a creature best described as exactly Doomsday from DC Comics. <laughs> Berserkers are immensely strong and savage locust drones who are incredibly hard to kill with conventional weapons. But they do have one key weakness in that they're completely blind. Armed with this knowledge, all the gears know that their best chance for survival is to stay quiet. Except for Giles, who noisily freaks out and sprints directly towards the berserker. Goes about as well as you'd expect. They said he'd never achieve anything. And he didn't, except possibly the cog medal for whatever the opposite of bravery is. Oh my god. But he was still a gear, so let's memorialize him with the traditional cog ceremony. All around me are familiar faces, worn out places. Beautiful. Could be that this whole fiasco wasn't entirely Giles' fault. When you finish Gears of War and the credits finally roll, you find out that Giles' first name is Redshirt. Wow, Red. Your parents had high hopes for you. Well, that's it then. Bring the ship back up to Combat Alert Alpha. I want everyone at their station. Everyone, sir? Everyone. And Cortana. Hmm? Let's give our old friends a warm welcome. So, good news and bad news. Bad news, your ship, the UNSC Pillar of Autumn, is under attack by the Covenant. You heard the lady. Move like you got a purpose. Good news, you've been ordered to get legendary Spartan Master Chief out of cryo sleep so he can save everyone's butts. Whoa. Sir? Right. Let's thaw him out. Okay. Bringing low-level systems online. Cracking the case in 30 seconds. You are Technical Officer, Third Class, Samuel N. Marcus. And this is what you trained for. He's hot! Blowing the pins in five! Before Master Chief can do any butt saving, however, he's going to need you up in the control room and your buddy Tech Officer Tom Shepard down on deck to thaw him out and recalibrate his systems. He can't crush the Covenant with inverted look on, for God's sake. Sort it out. When you lock on, it'll change color. Okay, that looks good. I'm ready, I'm ready for, for the, the energy, energy shield, shield test now. now. Please follow me to the energy shield test station. So far so good, but Covenant forces are literally boarding the ship right now, so there's simply no time to choose Master Chief's screensaver and ringtone. Bridge to Cryo 2, this is Captain Key. Send the Master Chief to the bridge immediately. Captain, we'll have to skip the weapons diagnostics and I- On double, crewman. Aye, aye, sir. The skipper seems jumpy. We'd better get moving. We'll find you weapons later. Sure, weapons. Who needs weapons when he's got Punchy and Fisto here? Hey, Sam. Hey. Sam, 
Oh god. They're trying to get through the door. Security! Intruders in Cryo 2! Please don't! Sam! Sam! Come on, we've got to get the hell out of here. And that was game over, man, for Sam Marcus, who was assuredly wearing a red shirt underneath his technical crewman jumpsuit. R.I.P. All right, Sam is gone. It's down to you and me now, Tom Shepard. You better lead the way because I'm encased in powered armor and you're a fragile bag of skin and organs. Oh, man. Now who's going to set my screensaver? Samus. Looks like I'm going to need to ask for your cooperation on this mission. If aliens taught us anything, it's that if you find yourself in an abandoned space facility and not played by Sigourney Weaver, then your odds of survival are not great. And in Metroid Other M, Special Ops soldier Lyle Smithsonian doesn't do himself any favours by being a generic member of the Galactic Federation 7th Platoon, who is easily freaked out by alien insects. Get away from me! Real smooth, Lyle. If only Lyle had considered being an adorable orphan or a potential love interest for power-suited bounty hunter extraordinaire Samus Aran, he might have made it to the third act. Well then, Lyle, investigate Sector 1 and show a little restraint with the explosives. Gotcha. But instead he dies ignominiously, off-screen, to an uncertain foe. Lyle's down. Oh no, who's going to tell his widow? He looks like a pile of rags. Okay, Pierce, not you. The rest of Samus' adventure in Other M is no picnic for the rest of 7th Platoon, in that all but one of them also end up buying the space farm in due course. But it's Lyle who's first to die. And it's Lyle who'll be remembered mostly for this trail of green alien goo leading away from his smashed up corpse. Ah, oh, Lyle. At least we'll always have... Um... The beginning of this mission? An hour ago? Get away from me! Good times. Isaac. Isaac, can you hear me? In Dead Space 2, the first non-flashback, non-ghost face you see is Franco De Leal, who's here to rescue you. Hooray! Dana, I found Isaac Clarke. Big fans of the Dead Space series will recognize Franco as the protagonist of Dead Space Ignition, a hacking-based puzzle game set in the Dead Space universe. In Ignition, Franco travels across the space station known as the Sprawl, trying to aid survivors and rescue Isaac Clarke from the Sprawl Hospital, which he reaches at the end of the game, and which is where Dead Space 2 begins. And that's it. Presumably then, Franco is going to be a big deal in Dead Space 2. I mean, he's already got all the backstory, so maybe Dead Space 2 is finally going to be the mismatched space buddy comedy I've always dreamed of. You're in terrible, terrible danger. Franco, come on, man. Gosh, that's... thorough. Is this going to take much longer? I'm double parked. Well, thanks a lot, Franco. You could have at least lived long enough to undo my straitjacket before your face exploded. And I've got to do this whole bit with no arms. There you have it, video watchers. It's all for another one. Uh, thank you so much for watching this from Outside Xbox. And if you'd like to watch something else, a little similar, but a little bit different, try this one. It's about the tiny details that you find so inexplicably disproportionately satisfying in video games, or from our sister channel Outside Extra, may I recommend this delightful video on the prisons in video games that held us for all of like five minutes. Remember those? Thanks for watching. See you next time. <laughs>